Uh, hey guys, welcome to the podcast. This is the first time we'll be doing something in English. And I'm super excited because with us, we have uh, Pastor Dr. Chris Green, who has, man, this is the first time I'm meeting you, but I have to tell you, you have been such a huge voice in my life in this year in 2020. And we'll get into it in the, uh, this episode. But uh, so I grew up incredibly Pentecostal, AG parents, uh, immigrant AG parents. We'll talk ab about some of that. But I had a hard time when I went off to college. Uh, I, I don't know if this is normal, but I felt like it was normal in my circle. Most guys go really Calvinist that grew up Pentecostal. Uh, and then as I got older, I saw the need for Pentecostalism in my life and in my heart. And not only in my life, but I saw how much it meant to my people, Hispanic people, that that was not necessarily happen in a Calvinistic reform world. And so I've had to wrestle with these ideas and having your voice has made it a lot easier in my life. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you for taking the time out yeah. to be on this podcast. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned to you over email, I do a Spanish podcast with my dad who's been in ministry for 30 years, but I've wanted to start getting other voices that have really meant a lot to me and have challenged my way of thinking. And a lot of those are unfortunately in English, which is great, but uh, we'll hopefully get some Spanish people to hear some of these things that I think are incredibly important. Uh, so thank you for yeah, your time. Thank, thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you for sure. Uh, so I don't wanna spend too much time here because I know this is a question that you get very frequently. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your upbringing. I know you grew up in Pentecostal holiness. Uh, and again, like I said, I don't want to spend too much yeah. time here because a lot of people start off here, but I just want people that are listening to kind of understand your background and your world. Yeah. So I grew up in Oklahoma and central Oklahoma, you know, similar culture, uh, I'm sure to what you know in Texas and in a Pentecostal church that was wildly Pentecostal, but even more rabidly holiness, right? Yeah. So we any we had church all the time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Saturday night. Once a month, we had Friday night. We had revival multiple times a year. Sounds I mean, like we were my in church world. more often than we were not. Yeah, we were in church more often than we were not. And it was, you know, wild in the sense that, you know, anything might happen at any point in the service, right? So we took pride in not following the liturgy in fact we wouldn't even have called it a liturgy sure you know they we, we we celebrated the interruptions of the spirit in a song or in a testimony or yeah. in a sermon and and the goal of the service was always the altar call right and so the altar call could happen at any time right mm -hmm. you might it might happen in the opening song it might happen during the sermon or at the end of the sermon but it was also that community was deeply concerned with what they called holiness which later in my life I came to see was was really just about dress codes right. and a certain kind of moralism, right? Yeah. It was a very narrow purity mindset that was mostly focused on women. I mean, I've, I've made the joke before tongue in cheek that the only rule for men was not to let their women break any of the rules. Right? So <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, it was, it was very much a kind of male centered culture and a, a deep concern for this particular kind of morality. So a lot of the preaching I heard growing up was about hell and was about sin, in particular the sin that provoked lust and that the call to follow God was the call to, to live this rigorously holiness life. And that if you did that, if you stayed pure, then you would have the power of God. So the purity of, the purity of your life opened you up to the power of God. And the more purity you had, the more power you had, right? right? So we we had the same, the clean are close, right? So if you stay clean, stay away from sin, then you're close to God. And if you're close to God, you're empowered by God for ministry. So that that's, that's the world that I grew up in. I went to Bible school and had what kids now are calling deconstruction. In, sure. But I never lost faith in God. I never, I never Which, had any- That's going to be one real... of our big questions for today. Okay, great, 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 great. Yeah, so I, I I never had a time where I doubted God, but yeah. I didn't know kind of who I was in relation to that. Sure. I didn't know what to think about what I believed or how to live. And so for you know, a huge chunk of my young adulthood was working through all of that. Right. Yeah. But I never I never left that confidence in God really, or it never left me, is what I should say. And 
I always understood myself as Pentecostal, even when I disagreed with almost everything <laughs> I knew sure. about Pentecostalism. Yeah. So I, you know, I stayed close to home in that way, right? In, in terms of the way that I was shaped and raised. And it really wasn't until I had planted my, my church along with some other folks and started teaching theology that I started to get a sense of how to hold all that together. Sure. So, you know, it was, it, it took me a long time, but yeah, and that gives you a, a sense of kind of what. Yeah. What it's uh, really funny because again, I've been just deep diving into uh, interviews, podcasts that you've put out and that people have had you on. And so much of what you're saying is so uh, my parents are similes of God. My dad has a radical life changing from drugs, divorce story to Christ. Uh, he's born here in the States, but moves to Mexico without knowing Spanish to go to Bible school, meets my mom wow. who is Mexican in Bible school. And then they move to the States. Uh, he's youth pastoring. And then he moves here. We're in Galveston, Texas, uh, and now has been here 30 years. And it's been very cool to see the longevity of ministry and uh, one of the things I tell my parents all the time is I'm very grateful because even though I don't agree, you know, one of the things that happens is as you get older and you learn, you start to see the the pitfalls in your parents and not even just your parents, but the people that you saw as leaders and their theology and the way that right. they view Bible. But I've been able to see the grace of God in their life from being very Pentecostal holiness, very about moral law, and then seeing the grace of God expand them to be kinder, to be nicer. Uh, and, and seeing that right caused this big fight in my heart, in my life, because when I went off to college, I was like, well, my parents had no law, no, even, uh, liturgy in the sense of the way that you live out the Christian life. Right. Uh, yeah. and so to me, Calvinism reformed theology made so much sense because it was all a plus B plus C. And I was like, this is what I need. This is what I want. And that made me yeah. kind of turn against my parents. Uh, their theology. Uh, and so my question uh, to kick off is, you said it, you kind of had to deconstruct how you grew up. How do we, that's such a hot word right now, <laughs> such a popular word, but I, man, I can't tell you, I went to Sa uh, SAGU, Southeastern Assembly of God University, which you went to Southeastern, I know. Yeah. Uh, I and yeah. there's so many guys my age, I'm 33, that started uh, went to theology school, went to ministry school, and I can't tell you how many have gotten divorced, are going through deconstructionism. Uh, I mean, so much. There's so much. We don't have enough time to get into all of that. But how do we do that? You've yeah, been so able to do that, that we stay faithful to God. Like you said, maybe it's him holding us. So how, how do we wrestle with these big ideas without leaving our faith? Or how have, maybe, maybe you don't have the answer for all of us, but you've been able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think some of it is there have to be people around you who are wise enough and patient enough to know the difference between the questions you're asking, which are questions that are necessary for learning, and the and doubt, right? So one of the things that I think is so unhealthy about a lot of our communities is they can't tell the difference between honest questions, which are necessary to learning, and and doubt and rebellion. And so one of the things that makes deconstruction really hard for a lot of people is the way their community reacts to their questions, right? Sure. And so if you raise an important question that the community should welcome because it's a chance for, for discipleship, it's a chance for formation. But if your community reacts harshly to every question, then it makes deconstruction not only about thinking through the theology, but it's about the shape of your life and your relationships. So the most painful thing about deconstruction is not the new ideas or challenging the old ideas. It's the pain of the relationships that break because you ask sure. those questions. So what we need are communities where it's safe to ask those questions. And there are people on hand who, if they don't know the answer to the question, they at least know how to live with the question. Right? They at least know how to say, well, I don't have an answer for you, but I'll pray with you. I'll study with you. We'll reach out. We'll find some people who can talk to us about this. I think. So in some ways, the, the weight of responsibility falls on the community, not on the person deconstructing. Because usually, the person deconstructing is young. Yeah. Not always, but usually. And and so it, it's not their responsibility to be wise and have all the answers. That's the, They're asking questions because they want to learn. Yeah. So I, I, the thing I would say first to the pastors and elders, the, the grandparents, 
in these communities, the, the stable, the foundation of these communities is don't be afraid of young people's questions, right? And if you don't have the answers, then open yourself up to people who can help. So, I mean, I, so that's the first thing I'd say. I think if you are deconstructing, though, try to do it in a way that is as respectful as you possibly can be to what brought you to those questions. Right? Yeah. So, and it sounds like this is what's happened, David, in your case, is that you you were able to honor what you saw God doing in your parents' lives and, and the lives of the communities that they served in. And if, if you can remain respectful about what God did with them, then that keeps you open to what God is doing with you, right? So I think one of the, one of the things to notice right away is a deconstruction that's born out of disrespect or even hatred for your parents and a deconstruction that's born out of real questions that are not being answered by your community. But it's, but what keeps it from being toxic is you still hold a certain kind of respect for them. You, sure. you still honor that makes sense. what God has done in their life. Right. So I think one of the, one of the things for those who are deconstructing, one of the things to, to kind of ask yourself about and to pray about if you can find, if you can find a way to pray is, you know, are my questions toxic or not? Right. So I, I think there are lots of good questions, but if I'm just reacting out of personal hurt against other people, yeah, then my questions become toxic, right? They're not, they're no longer, it's no longer really about the theology anymore. It's about the challenge between persons. And, and the goal of deconstruction should be, I mean, honestly, it shouldn't be deconstruction. It should just be discipleship. It should just be formation. And some things have to be rearranged. And, you know, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah talks about uprooting and tearing down. But the goal is always planting and building up. Mm. So if, if you are uprooting and tearing down, then if you do that in ways that are born out of respect, then when it comes time to plant and build, you'll be ready to do that. But sure. if it's born out of hate or spite or resentment or bitterness, then you you won't be able to transition to the planting and building phase. You'll just constantly be tearing down. Right. And and eventually that starts to eat you up too. You know, like and and I've seen that happen. I've, I've felt the threat of it in my own life many times, and I, I've seen it happen to so many of my friends. You know, who they start out with a legitimate question, they're met with ferocious pushback, and then it's about conflict and resentment and bitterness between people and the theology is just the excuse for right. mistreatment and betrayal and then that always descends into chaos right it always descends into just more and more destruction and pain so i i think i would say that's the most important part of the process is is to try to keep your heart as pure as you can and be as respectful as you can to the people you disagree with and that respect will kind of keep you tethered, will keep you from floating too far into the way you've been made to feel. Sure. And, and that, I think, is, is critical. I'm not sure if that's making sense, but I, no, I think it it's makes, a, it's it a makes really so much sense. So wh what would you encourage someone that in several ways? I have so many questions for you, so I'm sorry. I'm going to be so jumbled brained. No, this is uh, great. No, I love it. I love it. Uh, how, how would you encourage someone that is not in a community that is healthy? Right. So, uh, I think for me growing up, I, I went through that, right. Uh, my parents and my community, especially Pentecostalism, they were just like, pray about it, fast about it. You're not speaking in tongues enough, right? Like, you yes, know, every right. boy deals with pornography. And I literally remember a youth worker saying, when you want to look at pornography, just start speaking in tongues. Uh, <laughs> And if you're not, and that my deconstructionism is different than what we see today. I think a lot of deconstruction yeah. that we see today is because of fallen people, uh, of hurt, like you said. And so yeah, 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 yeah. waters get so muddied. There's a separation between yeah. just general questions and hurt from leaders and people. Absolutely. So if we're not in a community where we can safely do this, what would you, how would you pastor someone that maybe is watching this and is fully given up because they, not only are they deconstructing, they're not in a safe environment to do so. Yeah, no, but, and that's a really tough question. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you have to find a place where it is safe. And that's easier said than done. I mean, it's much easier to, to find, you know, it's much easier for me to say you should find it than it is for you to actually do the work of finding it. 
and it's hard to tell, especially when you're when you're in pain. It's hard to discern what safety looks and feels like, right? So, you know, I don't think there are any easy answers to that, but I do think it is important that you reach a point in your life where you, you've got to make that tough choice sometimes. And I, I think more often than not, you know, there it's somebody close at hand. I mean, I, I think God is always at work in our lives trying to bring people close to us who can guide us through that process. But I'm not naive. I know that there are some people, there, there just isn't anyone close at hand. And I think in those cases, you know, you just have to have the courage. You have to give yourself permission to say, all right, God, I'm going to trust you, but I'm going to trust you while I find, while I seek and find some people who are who are safe for me. And I, I think trusting in the long, slow work of God, right? So that, you know, maybe you do need some time away. Maybe it looks like leaving, you know, like the prodigal who leaves home for a while and then comes back sure. a different person. I, I don't think we should be too terrified or too afraid to do that. And if we need to go away, then we need to go away. And I don't think we should be too afraid if we're on the other side of that. You know, if we, if there are people in our community who need some space, I think we, we have to be able to afford that, but like we have to be able to give them that room and trust God and trust them enough that, you know, if, and when they need to be with us again, they will be. I mean, I, I, we need to lower the anxiety for everybody. Those sure. who are leading our communities and those who are leaving our communities, they need to have a, a sense of, God is creative and patient and merciful, and we can afford to give each other time. We, we don't have to fix everything today. Now, on the other flip side, what would you say to someone that is deconstructing and, like you said, in a mean, vicious way? Uh, they've been hurt. It's not about just asking questions anymore. It's about, I'm done with this. Yeah. I've been hurt. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not hard to just Google search bad leaders, bad pastors. And yeah. it's not hard to talk to someone that has been dealt a bad hand at the church that they're at. Uh, that comes so easy. And so what would you, how would you pastor us or guide us in the sense of, okay, you're not just asking questions anymore, right? I think of you become what you consume, like, especially young people, they're just full of the digital age. They're on their phone being discipled more than they are in their church or even in, in their, oh, in their Bibles. So how would you challenge us? What pushback would you give young people like, hey, you're not letting your Bible form you. You're letting other things form you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's so much I want to say in response to sure. that. I mean, one is. I'll have, if we I'll imagine, have all the time you'll give me. <laughs> okay. So if you imagine, you know, a well and someone comes along to fight you and, and throws a dead animal in the well, you know, throws a goat or a cow in, in the well to poison the water. That to me is an image of what it's like when you've got a toxic leader, you've got a pastor or a parent or a, a teacher, someone in your life with influence who, who essentially poisons the well of your heart, right? They, because of the way they talk about God or they talk well about God, but live in ways that contradict it, right? So, so I think there are lots of ways to be disillusioned. I mean, one is people are saying things about God that seem true, but then behind the scenes, they're living in ways that are predatory and abusive and vice versa. There are people who talk about God in ways that are predatory and abusive, you know, and, and that can be damaging. So our, our, the well of our heart can be poisoned a lot of different ways. But I think that at some point you have to realize I can't, I can't live. I can't live on this water. If that's poisoned and I can't let, I, I do think anger in a lot of our churches, anger is seen as always wrong, right? If you're angry, something is wrong. I, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I, Jesus is angry. The prophets are angry. The apostles are angry. I don't think anger is the problem. I think bitterness is the problem. Though. Mm. And so what we want is, how do I live with my anger in such a way that I can clean the well, get the animal out of the well, get the water clean again, so that I can work from that place of, of purity? I, and until I'm pure, until that well is clean, I really can't ask the questions or receive the answers that I need to receive. So I think that some of it, it looks like doing what you need to do to make sure your heart is as clean as it can be, as pure as it can be. And you're not eaten up with bitterness and, and resentment. Now, 
I don't want people to mishear me. I mean, if people have wronged you, anger is the right response to that. Like, there's there's nothing sinful in anger. But if you don't respond well to your own anger, eventually that starts to poison you even further, right? So anger should motivate you to get the well clean, not to, out of resentment, let the well be poisoned for everybody else, right? But that's the goal. So let anger lead you to a commitment to purify your heart as much as you can and not to, well, if you're going to poison me, I'll poison you back, right? That, that sense of retaliation or, or revenge, like you, you don't want to live from that. From, I don't think anybody does want to live from that place. So you, you kind of make the commitment to say, I'm going to give myself some time to get as healthy as I can in my heart, like to get my heart as right as it can well, be. When, when you and say healthy, can you dig in a little deeper into that? Someone that is hurt, their well is, is dirty, poison, like you're saying. What, what, what would you tell us? This is what it looks like to be healthy in that process. Like, h- how do we disciple through this on our own terms, right? Because, again, I'm hurt. My community is not helping me. My well is poisoned. How would you walk us through that in my personal life? This is how you clean that well. Yeah, so I I think it, it probably looks different for each person in a little in you know in various ways because it depends in part on how they've been hurt, right? So for instance, if you've been hurt by someone who's talked about God in a particular way, you probably need some time away from listening to people talk about God, right? I mean, you probably but I, I mean, I can't predict that. Who knows, right, how you need to do it. I think one thing I can say, though, is you can test the waters, so to speak, by what's strongest in you. Is the feeling that's strongest in you anger toward those who wrong you or compassion for those who have been wrong? Mm-hmm. So, again, there's nothing wrong with being angry. You should be angry. If you've been wronged, you should be angry. But the purer your heart gets, that anger becomes intercessory, not just reactionary. Which, right? so, by the way, one of my favorite and worst things about hearing you and having you in my life is how good you are, and it's terrible for me personally, at showing us the flip side of that coin. Mm-hmm. And showing us, hey, I know this feels okay. I know you're angry, but if you don't, here's what happens. And it's so wonderful, yeah. but it's so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I'm living the terribleness of it all the time. But I, I think that that's it, right? It, you're right to be angry. But if, if, you, if at some point that anger doesn't turn into intercession for other people who are wrong, it'll just continue to be self-absorbed. And at that point, it becomes bitterness. At that point, it becomes resentment. So anger toward what someone has done to you is right and good. But if you live with it the right way, it starts to be more about anger toward with what is on others, right? And, and that's what we see with Jesus. Hey, can, can you say that one more time? It kind of broke up just so we get it clear. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. That anger, sorry, though, the, we're storms here. So that's why we're um, having a little bit of trouble. But the, if you're angry about what someone has done to you, that's well and good. But if you don't turn that, eventually that becomes resentment. So what you want is to be angry for what is for injustice. But you want to be angry at the injustice done to others, mm. not just the injustice done to you, right? So if you do me wrong and I'm angry, that makes sense. But if you do others wrong, the anger that is in me becomes intercession, right? And that sure. that brings me into alignment with the character of God. And so I and that's what purifies me, right? It when I'm angry toward what has been done to others, it pure it can purify my heart. If I'm only angry at what you're doing to me, that's just that's just selfishness by another name. That's so good. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing this trend where, I don't know, 10 to five years ago, if you were angry, you were hurt, you just left and planted your own church. <laughs> and now people are just leaving the church. Uh, yeah. They're, and it's almost to what you're saying, like they're so poisoned that they just stay angry. Where wh- Whether it feels good or not, whether they planted a church, whatever, that's a different topic on leadership. But at least they didn't leave the faith. And now, instead of going to do something with it, they're just abandoning it completely. And that has been very heartening to see, honestly. A lot of friends that 
right, have poured into my life. I looked up to, and now they're just gone because of some hurt. Uh, now I would like to, which to however much you would like to share, as we've talked about, you, you've had to deconstruct, I'm sure growing up in Pentecostal holiness and then getting to the level of education that you're at, there was a lot of angst inside of you. Uh, I've been there. And so walk us through a little bit of your deconstructionism. What, what were the hardest parts that you faced? What, how did you deal with those things? How are you still reconciling those things? I'm sure, right? One of the things that happens is we, we learn and we are angry at everything that we didn't know, but then we come to peace and we start accepting again some of the things that we loved about what we didn't know. So walk us through your personal, okay, these are the things that, that I wish I was thought, I hated what your, however your journey of going through that was. Yeah. I mean, I think the most important theological move for me was realizing that God is like Jesus, entirely like Jesus, and that there's nothing in God that is not like Jesus. And that God is always better than I think he is. Like, no matter what I'm going to say about anything, whether we're talking about salvation, heaven, hell, judgment, the work of the Spirit, ministry, evangelism, doesn't matter. God is always better than I think he is. Mm. And that uh, this is the way I read, you know, passages like Ephesians where Paul says he's praying for us to know the height, depth, length, and breadth of the love of God, right? Which passes knowing, right? It's, it's too good to know. And he, he says that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think or even imagine. So it means that what, no matter what I can think to ask for, what God is doing is better than that, right? So wow. whatever, whatever good thing I can come up with for myself or for someone else, God is doing something better. Now, I, I, have to, I have to acknowledge that sometimes I don't know what the good is. Sure. Sometimes I think I know the good and I don't. But I'm never going to be better than God is. I'm never going to be more merciful or more compassionate or more patient or more just than God is. And so I can trust, absolutely trust, that God is able and that God is everything Jesus embodies. And beyond my wildest imagination, right? So I, I don't have to worry about the goodness of God. That, that I think that has to be basic. You, you can't worry. I think that's about God's so goodness. important. And the older that I'm getting, the more I see that. That if I have this initial reaction and in whatever life throws, that God is good. I don't know. I don't know, but He is in every situation. It, it helps me navigate life so much easier. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Well, because you have to you have to own your own limits and the limitlessness of God, right? So unfortunately, I think we've discipled people into acting as if they don't have limits and as if God does, right? There's only so much God can do, so you've got to do more than you actually can do. And one of the reasons I think you mentioned this, I think it was in the recording, but it might have been before we started recording, that a lot of young Pentecostal people end up in reformed circles, and this is why, because Pentecostal churches tend to preach a God who's limited and call us to act in ways that are not limited, like mm. as if we are limitless. That makes right? so much and sense. I feel like, like you it, just put a piece in a puzzle that I was missing. And it, it's bizarre. I mean, I know why we do it. The reason we do it is we're trying to motivate people to live the maximum Christian life. Right? Sure. So Pentecostals. In this way, historically speaking, Pentecostals are like a monastic movement. We're trying to call people to perfection. We're trying to call Christians up to the, the highest life possible in God. So the way you do that is by putting pressure on them to do more than they think they can do, right? So Pentecostal preachers are like, like coaches who are demanding more out of their players, right? <laughs> and they're, they're, they're trying to call their trainers who are demanding more out of the than, than we think we can give. And that works up to a point, but if you don't know when to stop it, you just end up breaking people, mm. right? So like if, if I, as a pastor, I can call something out of you that may be hard for you at first, but actually it's in you to do. And so at some point you break through and you realize, hey, I can do that. But if, if I just keep driving you and keep driving you and keep driving you, you're not limitless. Like you can't do everything. And so if I keep pressuring you to do everything, you know, not just win your friends to Christ, but win the city, turn the world around, right? <laughs> Bring revival every Sunday. 
you know, heal every sickness, cure every disease, address every problem in the church, you know, like explain every Bible verse. Like if, if we just keep pressuring people to do more and do more and do more, we end up breaking them inevitably because people are limited. And w- along the way, what we're doing is we're suggesting that you have to do this because God has chosen to limit himself, right? That God is is not going to do this. You have to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's a powerful technique, but man, it's incredibly damaging in the long run. Because I, it as you're speaking, God, I remember God. in college, like really getting into reform theology and feeling like a weight off of my shoulders, right? Because, Hey, yeah. it, it's not, I don't have to pray enough to win my friends to Christ, right? My youth pastor, Hey, you guys got to stay up all night. We're, we're going to invite our friends. If you don't, they're going to hell. And reform theology felt like a weight lifted off of my shoulders with exactly with what you're saying. Absolutely. And that, that's, I think that's why people are drawn to it. I think, I think they're drawn to reform theology for at least three reasons. I think one, this is the main one, in that God is a God who's capable, and it doesn't all come down to my performance. Mm. That's a relief. Secondly, it is, a, Scripture is central, not the personality. Yeah. So at least in, in theory, in Reformed theology, you know, the, the Scripture gives you a center that doesn't require the minister to have all the gifts, have all the answers, have, all, have the charisma to bring about everything that needs to happen in, in a church or in a ministry. So there's a, I'm not sure that's actually how it works in practice, but in theory, that's, that's on, on offer. And, and I think the third thing is in, in reform circles, the, the, and you already said this yourself, theology tends to be straightforward, right? It tends mm-hmm. to be, you believe this, therefore this follows, therefore this follows. And the simplicity of that and the relative straightforwardness of that is such a relief for people who've grown up not quite sure what we believe, but it, it is, a sense of it's a fly by the seat of your pants kind of theology, yes. right? So the Pentecostalism that you and I have known, which is kind of the dominant form of classical Pentecostalism in the U S there's no real the second or what's called second order theological thought. Nobody's really thinking through what we believe. Mm-hmm. We kind of have assumed beliefs that nobody ever really articulates. And they're <laughs> just, we're just preaching and praying and singing and testifying. And we're never stopping to think, well, when I say this and I say that, how are those two beliefs related? Sure. Right? So we will say things, of course, like God is the God who can do the impossible. But what we end up implying is that the minister should do the impossible. Mm. Right. But we never we never make that connection. So what what young people are experiencing in reform circles is they can start to see the skeleton of the body. They can start to see yes. the structure behind the belief. And that's a relief. Like, hey. There is some kind of coherence here, especially if, you, if you're intellectual in any way and you're interested in teaching at all. It's good to kind of realize, okay, I believe these things and I see how they're related to each other. And unfortunately, in the, in the Pentecostalism I grew up with, there wasn't any of that coherence behind it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, 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 it's exhausting to try to think about, well, then what do we believe? <laughs> like, what, what do we so actually I, I don't know if this hold? ever happened in your world, but at least in the Assemblies of God Hispanic world that I grew up in, it got it was to the point where churches would their worship team wouldn't even practice. The pastor would just get up ten minutes right. before, go, Hey, who knows how to play the drums? Come up. Who knows how to play bass? Let's Come up. Yeah. And would he would go, Hey, we're gonna sing these songs. All right, you guys ready? Let's go. And yeah. there is no structure. Uh yeah. and and well, so because and part of the reason that what's being assumed there, as you know, is the less we plan, the more room there is yes. to the spirit. So there's this yes. basic competitive notion that and this is one of the oddities, right? So what I was saying before about we end up putting pressure on people who are possible. But one of the ways we do that is by saying, be less prepared and more open to God, and then God will do the impossible through you. Mm. And that ends up making it so that not only are you pressed beyond your limit, but even the things you could do well, you don't do well. Right. right? <laughs> like, so you're being asked to do things you can't do, but you're not being asked to do the things you actually could do. Yes. And it ends up creating this very bizarre environment in which ministry <laughs> is always outside who you are as a person. I right? am so, like so I upset at you and so grateful for the vocabulary that you're giving me right now. <laughs> so like, it's, you know, a case in like in my case, like I have a particular set of gifts, right. That, that are from God, I trust, 
that are shaped in me by you know who my parents were and how I was raised and all this how whatever brings you your giftedness right but in the Pentecostalism I've known people don't really care about those gifts and they don't care about me developing those gifts they're wanting me to be open to God doing things that have nothing to do with me sure and weirdly that ends up making ministry kind of superhuman or pseudo human instead of it arising out of who I am as a person it becomes about this persona that I take on in ministry my openness to this something I'm not prepared for exactly absolutely and it's it's incredibly destructive because even if you're able to do that it isn't you and so when people are responding to that they're not responding to you and I, I was talking with, with a group yesterday about this very thing. And I said, fundamental, the fundamental conviction we have to come back to is that God's glory is on the human being, not on the persona. The spirit does not anoint a personality. Wow. The spirit dwells on people in their humanity. So in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about Moses is up on the mountain. He comes down, his face is glowing because he's been in the presence. And we preach that text like that's what we want, right? We want to be in the presence of God and come out of the presence of God so anointed that people can see that we're, we've been with God, that we've been with God. But that Paul says that wasn't good, that Moses came down from the mountain, his face was glowing, and he put a veil in his face because he didn't want them to see the glory fade. He didn't want them to see that the glory didn't stay on him. And he's doing this because he's trying to protect his own reputation and God's reputation. He's afraid that if they see the glory fade off of his face, they're going to distrust him and they're going to distrust God. And so what we need is to realize that the glory of God actually comes clearer as it fades. The more you see me as a person, the more you're seeing what it is that God delights in. Wow. It's not my personality. It's not when I'm outside of myself or larger than life that I'm who God's called me to be. It's who, when I'm most of myself, right? When I'm, when I'm fully human, that's what we say about Jesus, right? He's fully divine and fully human. Yeah. And so we, we need theologically our, in our preaching and our prayer and our testimony and our pastoral guidance. We've got to come back to this, get away from this notion that ministry is about me being outside of myself or, you know, being open to the God who does the impossible rather than, being in my humanity and trusting that God is working wow. there, right? God yeah. is working in who he has made me to be. That makes, that makes so much sense. Uh, even in this conversation, I'm going back to my childhood and in my teen years and fixing thoughts and ideas as we're speaking about these things. Uh, yeah. l- let me ask you this, uh, in, in this phase of you at getting education and, and stepping outside of your, uh, Pentecostal world, Right. One of the things, like, as you said, is, is holiness, the the way that you live, the way that you dress, the way that you talk. Uh, I I remember the maddest my dad ever got at me was when he found out I went to the movies at 14 and he just like spanked the crap out of me. Uh, and there was just this, like, you can't listen to secular music. I still remember the day I was taking a shower. I was listening to queen Bohemian Rhapsody and my parents got so upset. Uh, and so you live with this and I have this conversation with a lot of friends is you think God is always angry at you. You're, you're already sinning, right? I go to church. I'm at church every single day and God is still upset that I'm not here. I went and did this thing that my parents hated. So how were you able to get to the point where as we're speaking, God is always good. Walk us through that biblically, walk us through that in your process. Because we have a lot of people that are probably going to be listening that grew up in that mindset, and some of their parents are still in that mindset. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that conviction is from God, right? God has to work into your heart this conviction that He is good. I think your your task, my task, is just to trust that. Okay, God, I'm going to trust that you're good. I'm going to trust that you're better than I can imagine. And in spite of whatever anybody else has done to distort that. I'm going to trust it and I'm going to start, I'm going to read scripture. I'm going to pray. I'm going to live assuming that God is better than I can imagine. So whatever I'm thinking, I'm just going to keep insisting God is better than that. God is better than that. God is better than that. So whatever issue you give me, so let's say we're going to talk about suffering, like keep wrestling with it until you start to feel like, okay, that's good. And somehow God is better than that. Don't settle for anything 
that leaves you unsettled with the goodness of God. So it, it, let, let me give an example on suffering. So I think that's probably the most painful, for obvious reasons, the most painful theological issue to grapple with. You know, why is there suffering? Why is there such unjust, meaningless suffering in the world? And so for years, you know, I, I grappled with that. And, and I still grapple with it. And whatever I come to, I always tell myself at the end, okay, I'm getting closer, but God is better than this. Wow. Right? Whatever I'm saying, God is better than this, right? Sure. So, so what, I've, what I've come to say is I think you could track a kind of story through my life. I mean, I think there was a point in my life when I would have said, God wants us to suffer, but it's for our good. Right. right? So that I was your said, Calvinistic okay, phase. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. God wants us to suffer but it's for our good. But then there was something in there that was like, yeah, I mean, there's something close to truth about that, but that's, that's not satisfying. Like that doesn't make me feel like that doesn't move me to worship. It, it humbles me in a certain way, but it's mostly me having to bite a bullet. It's mostly me having to say, I don't like this. This doesn't make me delight in God, but I guess I have to accept it. And so I said, I'm not settling for that. Right. I'm, I'm not, because I don't think that is good enough. Yeah. And so I keep reading, keep praying, keep studying. And then I, I come to a shift of, it's not that God wants us to suffer for our good. God wants us to suffer for others' good. And that mm. felt a little more true to me. Like, it's not just about God forming me, but it's God is using my suffering for the good of others, right? Right. But still, it didn't, it didn't quite satisfy. It was a little better for me. It felt a little more true, but not still not adequate. So I, if you think about, you know, horrible things, that happened in someone's life, but then you think, well, maybe God's going to use what this horrible thing that's happened to you in the future for someone else's good. In that way, it's kind of redeeming it, right? So, like the Joseph story, yeah. God, you, you know, this was you meant it for evil, Joseph says, but God meant it for good. Right? And then what finally clicked for me after years and years of reading and study and prayer and conversation is that God doesn't need anything to do what He wants to do, mm. and that all along I had been thinking that there's stuff that happens to us and then God uses that stuff to make something. Else, yeah. Right. You know, that God makes good from evil. So evil happens and God makes good from it. And that therefore redeems. evil. And then it finally hit me. God doesn't need anything. He creates from nothing, right? He didn't, he didn't work with stuff to make the world. He called the world into being from nothing. Right. The God, our God is a God who creates from nothing, who raises the dead. I mean, Jesus says, you, you take pride in being sons and daughters of Abraham, but God could raise sons and daughters of Abraham up from these rocks, right? God doesn't need stuff to work with. He, he creates from nothing. God raises the dead. You know, he calls those things that are not into being. So what I what finally hit me is God does not make good from evil. He makes good in spite of evil and against mm. evil. So he doesn't want us to suffer, and he doesn't even want us to suffer for our good and others' good. He wants us to go to those who are suffering in order for us to redeem them and to work with him in redeeming them in the midst of their suffering. So that's been a major shift for me. I still think God is better than that, but he's no less good than that, right? He's no less good than the God who does not need suffering, but partners with us to go to those who are suffering. To so cry one with of the those that would cry say, and laugh with those. 100%. So he doesn't want pain for anyone. He doesn't want suffering for anyone. But he does want us to go to those who are suffering. To be with them as he is with us. And to redeem them and redeem this in, in spite of what they're suffering, right? So the, the example would be, I don't think God allowed slavery so that the African-American church would come. Like, I don't think in God, he doesn't need slavery in order to bring that about. Yeah. He brings about, you know, the black preaching, black singing tradition, not because he, not through slavery, but against it as a witness that that was always wrong, right? So he brings up good after suffering to show you the evil that brought the suffering about. Yeah. So the good comes up. So let me push back a little bit, yeah, thinking of, yeah. so why would God allow the slavery, right? Why, why would he do that in the beginning? or? Did he not? What would be your theological answer for us to navigate that? Yeah. Be so because I, what you're I saying makes a lot of sense. In spite of evil, he did this. 
So yeah. what about at the beginning of the seed of this evil? Yeah. So I, I've written quite a bit about this and I'm still, still thinking through it. I mean, I don't have all the answers by any means, but I, I think it's important to say that God not only doesn't use evil or need it, he can do good without it. He also doesn't allow it in the way that we're imagining. So I think when we think of allowing, we think of a God who could do something but doesn't. Yeah. Because he wants later to do something else that he couldn't do without this. But that, that can't be true, right? God, God, and this is where I think deep training in Christian doctrine is, is critically important. Yes. But one of the things that Christians believe about God is that God does not have potential. God does not have the power to do some things he doesn't do. God is always fully himself, right? God is always acting in ways that are true to who he is. And, and, and therefore, he's never holding back. He's never, you know, partially good to me. He's, he's always good to me in, in the fullness of his goodness, right? He's never giving me 10% of his mercy. He's always <laughs> pouring his mercy out on me, right? He's not, he's not withholding, right? The, the language of scripture is he withholds no good thing. He doesn't hold aspects of himself back. He doesn't show up in my life at 50% or 60%. I mean, he's always God in his fullness for me and for all, all things. So he's never allowing evil. He's always working against evil. But he's working against evil in ways that are true to who he is, true to who we are, and true to what he has created is. So I, I think it's critically important to say God does not allow evil in the sense that he steps back, could do something, but doesn't. He's always working against evil, but he's working against evil in ways that are true to us and our freedom and true to the, to the nature of things. And so God's work then therefore plays out over time. It plays out in history. So that, that, but that's not allowing evil, right? He's, he's working against it. We can't always see the way that he's working against it, but he is always working against it. And when everything is said and done, and this is what Revelation tells us, that when everything is said and done, what we're going to say is, God, you are just in all of your ways. Yeah. You're just in all of your ways. That everything you did was just. And, and this, to me, is, is a part of believing that God is good, that God doesn't have sides. Like, he doesn't sometimes treat some people with justice. and sometimes There is treat no casting shadow within him. Absolutely. He's not turning this way or that. He's not reacting. To, he's just always himself, right? God is always fully himself for us. But because we live in time and because we're broken by sin, we don't always see clearly mm. how God is working with these things. And it won't be until we know as we are known that we can see how God has always been working. So where I am right now in my life is God does not need evil. God does not use evil. God does not allow evil. God is working against it in ways that take time to be known. So that, that that's, I'm not sure that's satisfying. But it's, sure. it's closer to the truth than I was a year ago or five years ago, because I think it's it's closer to saying that God is good. He's better than I could have imagined. And a God who would allow evil, even for some later good, isn't very isn't very good. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I wouldn't allow. Well, don't tell John Piper that. <laughs> I would love to tell John Piper <laughs> that. I wish he would listen to me. Good and mercy, God have mercy on us. Uh, man, I want to ask you a million questions. I wish you were just my next door neighbor. First of all, uh, let's transition a little bit more to the question I initially wanted to ask you, I guess, uh, speaking more pastorally ministry wise. Uh, so my church specifically, we started off as a specifically just Spanish church only about 10 years ago. I told my dad, Hey, like the people that I grew up with the Island, there's no English church the way that we are doing it. You should do English as well. So now everything is both languages. Everybody on staff speaks both languages, uh, the same preaching, everything, right? So English and Spanish. Uh, but one of the problems that we have or that we're facing is our Spanish speaking community. I would say about 60 to 70% of our congregation is illegal immigrants. Uh, and a lot, I mean, it's not a joke or, or sarcasm or whatever. When I tell you that We've sat down with people that say, and I'm, we ask them, you know, how's your Bible reading? How's your devotional life? And they literally say, I don't know how to read. I didn't get an education. I had to start working right away. Yeah. Uh, and so in yeah. that process, how do we disciple people, right, to read and interpret scripture well? I, right? Like I've been thinking about this and 
specifically in scripture, when it talks about scripture in itself, it's always in a, in a room with people reading it together out loud. And so I get that sense, but obviously in Pentecostalism, we, it's about the individual a lot, uh, your walk with God. And so how can we keep a tradition of discipling of being an individual in love with God without people being able to literally read scripture? Yeah, no, it's a, these are great questions. I, I think, I think first and foremost, we need to go back to discipleship as a work for the sake of the community, not the individuals within the community. So discipleship is forming communities that have a particular witness, not about forming a bunch of individuals. So I think we should, we should shape persons, but persons are always in community. It's always me in relationship to you, not a bunch of individuals. So if you're concerned about individualism, I mean, if you're concerned about shaping individuals, you'll end up in individualism, which is you're trying to demand everybody be at the same maturity level at the same time, the same knowledge level at the same time, the same skill level at the same time. And that's inhuman. That's not who we are. That's not how God works with us. So the first and most important thing is discipleship is about forming communities, not about forming individuals. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we have to realize that Discipleship shouldn't depend upon people's individual readings of scripture anyway. Yeah. That, that actually what forms the community is the preaching of the gospel, not the study of the scripture on its own. Now, I know this could be misheard, and I want to be careful here, but we were never, I don't, I don't think God ever meant for the Bible to be used in a private way. Now, a personal way, yes but not in a private way. Yes. It's never my relationship to God mediated through my own reading of scripture. This is why I think preaching and teaching in the community is so central that those who are called to speak, speak to the community for the building up of the community. So what shapes me is not my reading of scripture, but the community's reading of scripture mm -hmm. grounded in the preaching of those who are called. So, even if there are people in the community who can't read, that doesn't put them at a disadvantage necessarily sure. because if they can hear, if they can hear the gospel preached in their language, then they can be disciples. They don't have to be able to read. Now, if they're called to preach, then they're going to need to be taught to, be, to read. Yeah. So one of the conclusions that I've kind of come yeah. up with or processed through this is I lived in Venezuela for two years, two years ago. And, uh, Pentecostalism is huge within the Latin American communities. And one of the reasons yeah. why I'm, pro I think is because a lot of the educational level is so low that the experience of it makes so much sense to them. And so though I can't read, though I can't be intellectual, I can sense and feel God. And so I, I don't need to be a smart person to know God. I can feel him when I come to church on Sunday. And that's such a beautiful thing, right? Like that yeah, God would well, commune with our people in that way that you don't need to be a reformed Calvinist theologian from Europe to know God, but God would meet you in this presence in this little mountain in Mexico or in Venezuela. Absolutely. And, and so yeah. that is to me has become such a beautiful thing. But Absolutely. as you know, we grow in a, and as I've fallen in love with scripture, wanting to help them understand this more. And so the, to me, that's been a way for me to answer that question. And as you're speaking, seeing that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's been most places in the history of the world. That's been true. It's been people, most Christians in the history of the world from the ancient world to now, their relationship to God is one that's bound up with other Christians who are teaching them about God. It's not them alone with a Bible figuring it out. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's how God meant it. I, I don't think we should be thinking of discipleship as thinking for yourself by yourself. Sure reading your Bible, right? So if, in fact, I think it's really risky and not to be too cute with it, but I think in some ways it's, it's harder to be a Christian if you can read for yourself because you're tempted to think your reading is what is the one that's going to save you. Wow. That's so right? good. Yeah. So you don't need, why do I need the community? Why do I need Pastor David? Why do I need the, the, the community, right? I can, I can read the Bible for myself. I can pray for myself. and there's a, that kind of individualism will destroy you and it destroys community. Which and is what we so see in the I West. Think, absolutely. Yeah. That's a very American, yeah. white American approach. And it is incredibly deadly. I mean, it's very, very deadly. So I think 
of course, we would love for everyone to be able to read just because it's a gift, right? And yeah. there's all kinds of joy that comes in that. But I don't ever want to suggest to someone that their reading of scripture is their lifeline to God, right? Sure. I mean, that, that's not how scripture, scripture works. I mean, and it's, yeah, I mean, so I can go on forever there, but I, I think that's the first thing. Now, I don't think you need a lot of education to read well. So let's say you can read, but you don't have, you know, a PhD or a master's degree. I don't think that's the issue. I think it's more about what you learn and the spirit in which you learn it than it is your education. Yeah. Right. And I think you need to know something about God. You need to know that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. You need to know what God's character is. You need to go know what God's nature is. You need to know the Ten Commandments. You need to know the the, the, the basic creed. Jesus is fully God and fully man. So there are things you need to know in order to read scripture faithfully, but that's not really about education in, in the academic sense, right? So one of the ways I would say this is I don't think all good Christian teaching is academic, yeah. but I do think it's all studious, right? You have to study to show yourself approved. Yeah. So you, you don't have to have a degree from a university to do this well, but you do have to be a learner. I mean, that's what a disciple is, is a learner. So you have to be studying the scripture. You have to be studying the best books that Christians have written on this. You have to be listening to wise voices. You have to be paying attention to your own life. And so I, I, I do want to emphasize that I think there needs to be training for our ministry. I don't think that necessarily has to be academic training. They don't have to go to seminary. They don't have to go to the university. But they do need to be trained. They can't just be turned loose to figure it out on their own. Sure. Because that there's too much at stake. So what would you... I, one of the questions that I'm constantly having with my dad is, uh, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but people of his generation, they are very, they, they went to a Bible school. They learned right. Very little. These, these truths that you're saying, they, they are not these scholars. They are not getting doctorates or PhDs, but they're so faithful to Christianity. They're so faithful to the word of God, to a living of a holy life. And yet people my age, especially kids of immigrants that go and get an education that are, are quote unquote smarter, right? Uh, they end up walking away from the faith, even though they went to a Christian university, even though they know they can read on their own. Well, what would you peg to that? Or I don't know. Why, why does that seem to be the case that, right? Like I luckily thank God I'm still serving God uh, through his grace, like still here. And, but I have seen that people my age tend to do that. And me and, and a lot of our, my friends that are in ministry are still serving God. We say, how come our parents and not knowing all the things that we know, not being so as well read as we are, have been so faithful to this through the hardest of the hard. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, man, that's a complicated answer, I think. And I don't, I don't think I understand at all. Sure. I mean, there are, but the aspects I think I can name are one is, it's just a cultural difference, right? And and in the immigrant communities, and I've, I've ministered in several now, not only Hispanic, but also Asian and Indian communities, immigrant, immigrant communities. And what part of what I've learned from those experiences is we're underestimating how powerful kind of mainstream American white culture can be in terms of the questions it generates, in terms of the perspectives it forces on people. And that's a lot. That's a lot for people, immigrants of another culture and another generation to manage, right? So I think that in terms of scripture, you've got the problem of generations exists even within a culture, right? So fathers and sons, you know, the prophecy that, you know, before the day, great and terrible day of the Lord, I will send a light to the prophet and he will turn the hearts of the fathers, the hearts of the sons and the sons, the hearts of the fathers. So it's possible for fathers and sons, one generation and the next, to be estranged from each other within a culture, just because of the way generational life is lived. But when you add to those generational differences a cultural difference, it, it just makes it exponentially harder mm -hmm. to communicate. Because you're, you no longer are asking the same question. So, of course, the same answers don't work, right? And it's, it's incredibly difficult. I think that what it requires is on the part of the founding generation, the immigrant generation, from another culture and another language and another time, 
is the humility to be open to God bringing in voices that can speak to their kids in ways that they cannot. Mm. And that is, in un, as a parent, that is unbelievably hard to do, to have the wisdom and the, and the humility to say, I want my kids to hear what they need to hear, even if it can't come from me. Wow. Like, and I think that takes a lot of, yeah, humility, a lot of character. That I would credit that stuff. to my dad a lot. Yeah, that yeah. our church is not a small 12, 20 people, which is how it was when he got here, because he's been able to see that, to go, yeah, hey, yeah. I, I need to speak to the people outside of just this. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and it, that's, a, that's a witness worth celebrating. Because, sure. Because it is rare. It is hard to do. It, it, it takes a lot of patience and humility. I think on the other side, it's about those of us who who have questions our parents might not be able to answer is realizing that just because they can't answer them doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. We're just in a different place. We're, yeah. we're in a different time. So we're asking different questions and we can't resent our parents' generation not being able to address that. And, yeah. and weirdly, if we can honor what they did do right, that will open our perspective up to seeing what sure. we're asking differently, to being to being open to different kinds of of answers. And I think people like you, David, are, and I, and I think in some ways I'm like this. Although obviously the ethnic factor is not the same for me, but there are those of us I think God calls to be Barnabas, kind of mediating figures, right? Who are in several cultures at once, sure. talking with multiple people at once. You know, being able to, to shift from one language to another, communicate, I think those are critical. And I think without those kinds of calls, all of this will fall apart. Yeah, that makes so much sense because as we're talking, you know, I still have friends that are like, man, my parents don't understand the way that I dress, the movies, the music. And it's just, and I, I want to, I love God. I love the church, but it's hard for me to be here, right? Or, even, I mean, you know how yeah. pastors, kids, you, you, become the youth pastor because nobody else is around and you're like 14 years old and you're like, I'm, why am I doing this? Uh, so yeah, man, I can't tell you, I, at least for me, I don't know. I'm hoping that some of my friends hear this, but the healing that has come from some of the things you've been saying, especially when it comes to the history of how we grew up this like hard, rigid. And like I said, for me, I'm very thankful that with my parents, I saw, the grace of God continue to grow them to where they go. Maybe we weren't so right about this. Like one of the most beautiful moments I have, a, I have a great relationship with my parents and I'm very grateful for that as well. But at 25, my dad finally went to the movies with me <laughs> and he <laughs> that night asked me for forgiveness. And he said, Hey, I shouldn't wow. have done that to you when I was 14, when you were 14. Right. And like yeah. I, that grace to me is like, yeah. if I like that's it. to me, that's the only reason I think I serve God other than with how good yeah. he is, but uh, because my parents were yeah. willing to allow God's grace and to be humbled, to do some of these things that you're saying and to repent even Absolutely. to us as kids, it makes me go, I know that I'm terrible. And without God, I would never be able to be so forgiving and loving and ask for forgiveness, especially now as a dad and as a husband. And seeing that in Absolutely. my father makes me go, there has to be a God because without him, I'm terrible. And I would never be able yeah. to do that. Man, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I was just talking with Mark Sharona last night about Elijah and Elisha and about the ways in which, you know, I, I just referenced the, the prophecy a moment ago that Elijah's calling is going to be to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the hearts of the sons and the hearts of the sons yeah. back to the hearts of the fathers. What's striking about that is that that's not what Elijah actually does. Like if you go back and read first king elijah is a, he has no father i mean he's he's not named his father's not named and he comes out of nowhere and he's a fiery confrontational threatening figure and and then he's the last thing god commands him to do is, is to nurture elisha to replace him and actually what's going on there is Elisha teaches Elijah how to be a father. So mm. the son, Elisha, washes the hands of his father and keeps washing the hands of his father until at the end when Elijah's caught up in the whirlwind, 
he, Elijah cries out, my father, my father. Mm. And, and then the mantle falls on him. And that the point of that is not that he will have twice the effectiveness of Elijah. When he says, I want a double portion, he's not saying, I want to be twice as good as you. Yeah. He's saying, I want to be your eldest. I want to be your son. And one of the things I would say to young people, your age, my age, and younger, is keep your heart pure. Wash the hands of people who, even if they don't see you yet the right way. Yeah. And sometimes God works that way. Sometimes God teaches people how to be fathers through their sons. And if you're a father, you shouldn't expect that, though, right? What should happen is fathers care for their sons. And yeah. So I, I think, you know, if, whoever's listening today, hearing what we're saying, you know, if you have some authority in the community, then model what your father modeled. Model humility, model patience, model repentance. Model saying I was wrong yeah. and and change because that will do far more good than anything you get right. And this, this is the wonder of God, right? That the leader who apologizes for what he gets wrong and makes it right does more good in that wow. than he would have if he had just been right in the first place. Dang. Right? Because you're modeling humility. You're modeling the character that's required yes. to take on the character of Christ. So, you know, for those who are in authority, please hear us, right? Model humility, model smallness, wow. and flexibility, so good. and openness. And most of these questions that are coming up in, in young people won't be toxic if our leaders won't be defensive. If yeah. they don't, if they're not reactionary and demanding, if they're like your father was, ready to apologize, ready to repent, ready to change, then it will open our communities up, and these questions can be asked and answered. And on the other side, those who are younger who feel like their questions are becoming toxic, you know, do the work of keeping your heart right. Just just keep coming back to, I've got to get the, the dead animal out of the well, sure. right? Because I I need to work from a place of purity. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I think for me, that's the bottom line. Uh, let me start closing out. I, I don't want to take too much of your time, uh, but... I first of all have to give credit where credit is due. One of the ways that I found you was through Cameron Combs. Uh, oh, cool. He, we went to yeah. college together and uh, I saw some of the stuff you were posting. So he said to say hello. Uh, and I cannot thank you enough for it. I feel like this has just been a therapy session for me. Uh, <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I told you in the email, I mean, this is the kind of work I love most. I mean, of all the things I do, this, these are the conversations where I feel like the most important work is done. So thank you for the invitation and hello to Cameron. I'm glad, I'm glad that he connected us. That's, that's beautiful. And I'm happy to do it again. If at some point, please. Yeah. I mean, um, I would you, you do it every day with you if you would let me. Uh, <laughs> and so I just had a few questions just to get to know you personally as well. Uh, the, if you okay, were stranded yeah. on an Island and you could only take five of these things with you, those being uh, movies, uh, books or albums, what would they be? For sure. I mean, I love movies and I love, I love music. You can give us but, those yeah, too as cool. well. Uh, so I don't <laughs> know you, but fire. just through yeah. your, your persona to me, I don't know. You're there in Tulsa. If you know who, uh, uh, dang, I just, uh, uh, I forgot his name. McPherson. He's a, he's in a band. What is his name? I, I just completely blanked. And it's like, I don't know, rockabilly blues band. Uh, and you, I'm, I just I feel like it. you're his guitarist, uh, okay. to me, okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. and I mean this in the most honorable sense, you're, you're a John Mark Comer raw denim, uh, mm. and, uh, Jonathan McPherson, that's his name. I don't know. I'll text it to you, but he's, it's a really cool yeah, rockabilly band. Like and to me, you're just the theological rockabilly band. Uh, I'll take it, man. I love it. That's great. That's great by me. I yeah, I, I would definitely take books. I think I would take novels and books of poems. I, mean, I that, saw that you've been reading uh uh MacArthur. No, not MacArthur. I'm just blanking. Gormac McCarthy. Oh yeah, yeah. Cormac McCarthy. Yeah, that would definitely be one of the books. So I, I um the book that I just finished, which will come out late this summer, uh is is a book about Christ and the art, and there's a lot in there about film and Very cool. and music, but especially about 
about novels and including Quantum McCarthy. So I hope everybody will check that out when it comes. Very cool. Yeah, I went to Sagu and what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a, a film critic and I wanted to write about film and theology and how they coexisted. Uh, yeah. I just, I love film. And, uh, but I was like, I grew up, which was a big separation between me and my parents. Like I love punk rock and hardcore and was like in hardcore bands. And like my parents were like, what, this is not Jesus. Why are you doing this? Uh, and so like, that is my world. And I, I love that aspect of God that he would use those things for me and in me yeah. to, uh, love him. And that's so beautiful. So well, with your, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Did you see the, the lecture that I gave a couple of weeks ago on Christ in the art? Uh, I saw, um, I saw you post it, but I haven't been able to watch it yet. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think you would you did that. I mean, given the stuff you're interested in, you should definitely you should definitely take a look and let me know what you think. Yeah. Uh, if if you don't if you can't find the link, just email me or text me, and I'll, I'll okay you. for sure. But yeah, hit us with your answers, man. I'd love to uh, get to know you outside of the how smart you are. <laughs> well, I think the, the first since you mentioned Cormac McCarthy, I would want the road. I would want Blood Meridian. In fact, I could just take Cormac McCarthy novels. I love them so much. <laughs> I'd want to just um, take him. <laughs> Oh, that be, would be even better, man. Yeah. I, I, although, you know, I bet you'd have to know him for a long time before the conversation would flow. I mean, oh, it absolutely. Like somebody would be hard, hard to get to know. It would might, but, it might make the stranded Island worse with him for the first two or three years. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hopefully he would live long enough yeah. on the, de on the deserted Island that you would, you would win his favor. No, I mean, yeah, I, I think one of the things I love about McCarthy, just, I know you're asking me for a list of books, but I mean, what I love about it, is is how unafraid he is to deal with the ugliness of life, the pain oh, yeah. of life, and still in the heart of that to find the witness that cannot be eradicated. Right, the, this yeah. this image that he comes back to again and again of hope against hope. Yeah, right. And it seems to me that that's deeply Christian. That to be Christian is to be in the heart of the suffering of the world, always open eyed about the suffering of the world, but still hoping. Right. Yeah. Somehow hoping, not because you're naive, not because you've closed your eyes to reality, but because you see the world in all of its brokenness and you still trust God. Mm. And that to me seems profoundly holy. Right? Yeah. That, 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 that's what it means to be a saint. That's no country for old man prophet. changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. Same for me. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 oh. it's incredible. And the movie, the movie yes. does justice to the book. Which it is does such great justice. I, yeah. I feel like he is just, an old Testament writer for our times That's and exactly right. he yeah. being able to read him. And even uh, most of his films have been adopted. I mean, most of his books have been adopted to films very well. All of them, but like yeah. the people that honor him in that way, do it so justly. Uh, but yeah. it, reading him and watching the stuff that he has written in film, like makes me be able to digest the old Testament a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I, that's part of the lecture that I did that I mentioned is is to talk a little bit about how art, fiction, poetry, film, dance, music, it gets at our heart differently than than we might expect. And I think scripture actually is art and does yeah. that for the same sure. reasons, right? I mean, it, it, it's poetry, right? It's proverb, mm -hmm. it's parable, and we we need to be artful in that way to even appreciate sure. what what god is giving us yeah when i read james so, i just think of him as the lead vocalist of a hardcore band just <laughs> just true. raging you know like he's true. the lead singer of black flag <laughs> yeah. and he's just saying these things that that to me makes it the perfect. most sense. i mean that should be an album absolutely yeah. that should definitely <laughs> be an album for sure well no, no I'm, I'm with you i mean i think that's that's beautiful and lovely and i and i i i read or I try to read quite a bit of fiction and poetry and, and try to do it myself. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm terribly good at it, but I try sure. to write it too, because I think there's something about working with language that even if you don't produce a great poem, you've not wasted the time because right. you're learning about language, right? You're learning about, sure. I've been working on, on a poem for the last few weeks about Isaiah. And what came to me was Isaiah thinking about, his experience, but late in life, right? So he's dying and he's thinking back on his high and lifted up experience, you know, the, the living pole on his mouth. 
And I mean, I don't know that the poem will ever be anything I'll be proud of, but sure. the work I'm doing around it, right, is bringing me back to that story. It's bringing me back to language right. in ways that I think are critical for a, that is critical for me as a teacher, as a preacher, and that all of us who are engaged in ministry, whether it's poetry or music or fiction, whatever it is, we need something that brings us back to language because at the end of the day, we're speaking for God, right? And we're right. listening and reading for God. And that that is about language. That, yeah. And that's in, in our Pentecostal tradition. And now we're far afield, I know. But this is the way I understand the spirit, the spirit's relationship to tongue, tongue mm. speech, speaking in tongues. Is the spirit is empowering my ability to speak multiple languages, not only literally, but figuratively. Wow. Right? That Don't do this to me right the now. Spirit is, <laughs> the spirit is giving oh me language. Oh my right? gosh! Yes, yes, and, oh. and giving me the ability to hear. That is so languages. beautiful. Like, it, it's not just about my ability to. And so, what that looks like for me is, if oh. someone is, is is suffering, the spirit gives me the language, wow. and sometimes that's silence. Yeah. Sometimes that's tears, but the spirit gives me the language. If I'm open, the spirit gives me the language to speak to their suffering or simply to be quiet. Right. I mean, that yeah. the Job's friends, for instance, they were in the spirit so long as they kept their mouths shut. Right. Like mm -hmm. the it's when they started. Well, even the spirit will give us the words even in our quietness and our groaning. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Sometimes <sighs> that's the only word you can say is no or groan. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think the, and, and I, so I think the spirit is always trying to bring us back to, to this gift of language, wherever it comes to us. Sure. Whether it's again, song or poetry or. Well, or as you're saying or that film. it, it makes so much sense to me. If, if we want to say prophetic in our Pentecostal language that I have been able to, like you said earlier, be in these worlds, English, Spanish, uh, I love Ooh. hardcore. Like, uh, I used to put hardcore shows together. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have a flea market at my house that I just threw together with my friends because I'm an adult now and I just can't go to hardcore shows. Uh, and, and just yeah. these worlds that, and I'm always like, why did God give me this? And it being, as you're putting it through the tongues, the language, the, Absolutely. and that's that makes so cool. much sense to my heart and my brain as I look at scripture. And that's so beautiful. Yeah, man. Yeah. And I think if you can see, for me, that's what, what I delight in, in terms of being a Pentecostal. I don't think that our tradition has much to say theologically, sure. unfortunately, yeah. but I think we have a whole lot to say about openness to the many tongues of the spirit and readiness to let the spirit lead us into places that no one else would go and, and to recognize that God is at work there. So I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I celebrate what you're doing. I think that's, I think it's beautiful and it's part of your calling and it, it just opens up more and more space for God to, to act in the world. Sure. Wow. Well, uh, you, you still didn't answer the question. We got into a whole nother thing, uh, but hit us <laughs> oh, with your about, books. Like, what, yeah. <laughs> so definitely, definitely the road, definitely no country for old men. I would take a couple of Dostoevsky novels. So the idiot for sure. Everybody would say Brothers Karamazov, so maybe that, or maybe Crime and Punishment, or I don't know, two two Dostoevsky novels, so two Cormac McCarthy, two Dostoevsky novels, and then a novel called Loris by Eugene Valadovsky. Um, if you, if you guys haven't read Loris, you you definitely should. So it's it's a story of, uh, about a medieval Russian monk, and it's a story of his redemption. Oh, and cool. So he's it begins with a hor horrific failure, um, which I won't spoil. And then you just kind of work through the arc of his life and end up in him as an old man, kind of coming to understand who he is. And he has a series of names. He gives himself a series of names or receives a series of names through the novel. And it's, yeah, it's, it's glorious. So I, I would say those are probably the ones I would pick, at least today. Ask me tomorrow, I'll give you a different list. Do you have, uh, I don't know, answers for the movies or uh, for the music or film that you would take with you? Yeah, music changes a lot. I'm, I'm pretty, I, man, I love a lot of different kinds of music. I have stretches where, you know, I'm into kind of classical music, but I'm also into everything else too. I mean, electronic, folk, 
rock. Um, the only thing I don't like at all, really, is country music, unless it's like old school country sure. stuff. Um, you should check out Midland. The, the, oh, I, I don't know this. You'll have to check. They're it. like I, a new. I don't know it. They're like honky tonk, like a new modern honky tonk. Cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. You feel send it to me. So I, I'm I'm wide open, and that's basically just depends on my mood. You sure. know, I kind of wake up and know, you know, what do I need to hear? What do I need to, need to hear today? Um, in terms of film, yeah, I mean, I love one of the things my wife and I do just just for fun is see movies and watch shows together. So that if if she were coming with me to the deserted island, I would have to take movies, not books. Sure, it's, it's something we could we could share. But you know, I love I, I mean, No Country that you mentioned, Coen Brothers films. I love yes. I love those pretty much all of them. Yep. I mean, I I like all of those. The other filmmakers I like the best, I think, are probably Terrence Malick. Okay. And the you know movies like The Thin Red Line. His most recent one is about um, a, a man who resists the Nazis during World War II. I can't remember the name of it, but I know which one you're talking a, about. A Hidden Life. A Hidden Life. A Hidden Life is, yeah, is the name of it. And I write about that in the book that's coming out. Um, Tarkovsky, who's a Russian filmmaker. My family on my dad's side are are from Russia. And so I've got you know, some commitments to that part of sure. the world anyway. So I I love I love those films. But really I'm I I mean I love watching T V shows and, and films. So I, I don't know that would change day to day too. So that's probably <laughs> yeah. where I would start. Tarkovsky, Malik, and Cohen Brothers. Great. I mean, that's a wonderful place to start, except you'd probably be depressed the whole time. <laughs> I'm a dark soul. I'm a, I'm a very dark, very dark soul. Cool. Well, uh, Dr. Chris, Pastor Chris, uh, thank you so much for your time. I have a million other questions. Uh, so I would love to have you back on at some point again. Yeah. Like, absolutely. I know everybody says that, but I'm 100% serious about it. <laughs> uh, oh, and- well, listen, yeah, somebody, I did one, I did one of these a few weeks ago and someone said that like you know I'll, I'll contact you as soon as we're done here and then i never heard from them again so no if you <laughs> but let I, me, I, I, will, think you, I think you're serious i want to be your best friend and i don't want to shy away from it uh and <laughs> i cannot cool. tell you yeah. enough okay. how like the work you're doing for someone like me has helped me process so much and return to in a biblical like educational way, I guess, to the roots of my Pentecostalism and be okay with it and be able to sit in that environment. And it makes sense. I had felt hurt and, uh, had nothing to do with it, uh, because of the way I grew up and being able to have your voice in my life in this last year has opened me up even more. So I, I, I was there. I mean, I work here with my parents. Uh, and so I cannot thank you enough for, uh, the time and hours that you have spent studying and continuing to stay rooted in this uh, culture and life and theological viewpoint, especially for someone like me. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Dave. That's, that's, that's very kind. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very and, much. We'll uh, do it again. Yes, please, we'll do it again, please. Sure. Uh, and do you have any last words for us uh, as you take off? Oh, just just thank you, man. Thanks for thanks for reaching out. And I mean, I love I love the connection. I love the work you're doing. I hope you'll pass on my love to your father and your we have to have you in some, at some point, uh, you, yeah, your work to, I've is never been to good. Galveston. It's, it's the best, but I would love I'm to. incredibly biased. <laughs> uh, That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Yeah. Reach out and, um, tech, you've got my number. So yeah. hit me up and we'll, we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Thanks a lot. Have, have a great day. One. You too. Bye-bye. Wow. What a great podcast. What a great time. Uh, Dr. Chris has really meant so much to my life. Uh, I started following him because he posted something last year during the Black Lives Matter protest. And uh, it was biblical. It was honest. It was truthful. And he has so much material on looking at our culture of Pentecostalism in an intellectual way and why it makes sense and why it can be biblical and why it should be biblical and why we should be in it. So please look him up. Uh, We will for sure have him back. I still have a million other questions for him, but thank you so much to him 
for chatting with us and talking to us. I loved that conversation. I still had a bunch of other questions. I wanted to be really smart for him, but that got out of the way because he's such a nice guy. So thank you, uh, Dr. Chris. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to have more guests like him. We'll start a Spanish playlist. I mean, an English playlist on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want it on audio format, we can do that as well. But make sure you like, subscribe, and comment. The Spanish podcast is going to start again next week. I don't know when this is going to come out, but it'll just start again next month. Me and my dad, we just sit down in Spanish and we talk about life. We talk about ministry. Uh, so yeah, share that. If you listen in Spanish, you could listen next month. It's already next. It's already next week, next month. Isn't that crazy? Uh, you can listen to that. You could share it with people. But again, uh, thank you to Dr. Chris, Pastor Chris. Uh, that was such a wonderful conversation. So this is Amigos Para Todos, English interviews. I don't know. I just wanted to talk to Chris, really. I want to talk to a few other people uh, about them that have uh, helped me in my life, biblically, theologically, intellectually. Uh, so that was such a great conversation. My heart is happy. I hope you're happy. Have a great day.